these guys get turned off, right? Turn them off. Because then you know it's going to ring. And, and then you'll be embarrassed, and then I'll make fun of you, and I will. That's why I have name tags. We write down your name and say, what phone that started. Okay, so uh, I've been asked to give the first lecture on Freedom Basics. And um, a lot of stuff has been written on, on freedom. Uh, freedom is a, is a word that has been argued over fought over for centuries, and I've been asked to cover the basics in less than an hour. So I think that I might have to skip maybe a point or, or two, maybe. Uh, so when, when somebody says, says freedom, uh, they can mean it in a couple of different ways. Uh, the freedom to and the freedom from. So think about this. The freedom to worship God in your own way, or not at all. The freedom to write what you want in your newspaper column or blog. Uh, the freedom to pick your own friends, to gather with them as you please. Now contrast this with uh, the freedom from want. The freedom from hunger. The freedom from illness. Now, there's a, a fundamental difference between these two concepts. But the word freedom is used by both sides, both sides of the debate. And that tends to make the debate rather confusing because both sides say, we want freedom. Well, as a result, many on, on our side, the good guys, right, uh, they sometimes use the word liberty instead. And, uh, of course, you can say without losing the meaning, uh, the liberty to worship, the liberty to write or to assemble. Uh, but it's rather awkward to, uh, to say the liberty from want or liberty from hunger, the liberty from, from illness. It's, it's a clunky phrase. It really doesn't, doesn't fly. Uh, so language is important. Language is important. And I don't want to lose, in other words, the collectivists. I mean, we've already lost the, the word liberal to them. So, so I, I say that's enough. That's enough. They don't get any more words. We're keeping liberty. Uh, the concept of, of, of liberty, or, or freedom too, is it's a rather new idea. Uh, it's a radical departure from, from earlier thinking. In fact, it's, it's a very radical idea. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, who you might hear a little bit about this week, um, he argues that the idea of liberty is distinctively Western, and that it came up in, in the Western culture. That the idea that there are rights that belong to individuals, and that they come before the creation of government, is the opposite of medieval law. Okay, It's the opposite, it's the reverse of medieval law. It, the concept of, of liberty and freedom says that each individual is unique and therefore there is worth and value in each and every individual. Now, F.A. Harper, in his book, uh, Liberty, A Path to Its Recovery, and I, I have props, right? so, uh, so it looks like this. I, I stole it off the bookshelf and then I will dutifully file it on the white table, not reinserting it on the shelf, but uh, um, Harper states it this way. He says, the, the concept of liberty rests on the supreme dignity of the individual. And that's a fairly important distinction. It's a radical thing because it says people matter. And if we look back at the last 5,000 years of recorded human history, who are the, the serfs, the peasants, the, the, the peons, the nobodies? Well, they were the nobodies. They were those that were sacrificed to the means as means to some greater end at the whim of some king or emperor. So this line of thought has, has evolved. It's changed and we can trace it through the works of people like John Locke and Montesquieu and Thomas Jefferson, Frederick Bastiat and Lord Acton. And what these guys argue is that government is created by individuals for the protection of individual rights. That's why we have government. The common element and the key to their reasoning is what we call 
methodological individualism. Okay, now here's your, your first uh, big college word. Getting, you know, because it's a university, right? It's Freedom University, so we need college type words here. Methodological individualism. And I'm going to talk a bit more about this in, uh, in the lecture after dinner, but I, I want to just touch on it now, what it means. Um, and when we look at methodology, or anytime we see the word ology or ological, it means the science of. So methodology or methodology is what? It's the science of, and, and our science, our scientific method, is basing it on its most elemental part, and that's the individual. We can't break it down any further than that. And today we suffer from the use of collective nouns and we personify it. It's just the way that we communicate with each other. And so someone might say today, General Motors filed for bankruptcy. Well, General Motors is not a real person. General Motors is not a real general. Okay. <laughs> General Motors does not have a brain or a heart or a soul or anything like that, right? What is it? It's a, a collection of people, a group of individuals working together that produce cars, that produce these other things like financing and such. And so we use these sort of collective nouns. The EPA regulates. The United States has invaded. General Motors files, right? But there really isn't such a thing, okay? These are just collective nouns, and we have to be careful about these. Okay? But methodological individualism says that, that we have to focus on the basic unit, and that's the individual. And now we'll, we'll use that much more in, in the, the next lecture on uh, praxeology, supply, and demand. Uh, but back, back to uh, freedom. Uh, the path from individualism to, to rights and a theory of a free and prosperous society has taken many forms and, and many shapes from many authors. And so um, I've identified four different approaches. And are these, these categories the best categories? No, these were just sort of categories that came to me. Uh, the first one is the natural rights approach. And... Um, some authors that, that typify it are people like Frederick Bastiat and Murray Rothbard. And basically what they say is that life is given to us by God. At least um, uh, Bastiat does in, in The Law, another, another prop. Um, I'll use that prop again. Uh, now from, from this position that life is given to us from... from uh, given to us by God, from this position and combined with the fact that there's scarcity in the world... In other words, can't have all the stuff that we want, don't have enough time to do all the things that we want. And with the fact that we do not live in isolation, we can deduce natural rights of life, liberty, and property. Some of you might say, I thought that's supposed to be pursuit of happiness. Yeah, well, where do we find that actually? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Declaration, Declaration of Independence. Now, who wrote that? Well, it was a committee. It was a committee, yeah. Jefferson was the primary author, and he originally had life, liberty, property. Took it right out of John Locke's second treatise of government. And they said, eh, people aren't going to pick up guns and fight the biggest uh, war machine ever known on this planet, at that point in time, um, for life, liberty, property. We have to flower this up, get people's passions going. So they put in pursuit of happiness. So um, that, that, that's what happened. Uh, more on, on natural rights theory in just a little bit. Uh, the utilitarian approach. Uh, the utilitarian approach is basically um, following the idea of utility. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the next lecture. But it's a level of happiness. It's weighing pluses versus minuses. And the more utility you have, the happier you are. So the utilitarian idea says that freedom is better because 
we're rich, we're more wealthy, we're more prosperous, we have a higher standard of living. Our utility is higher. This uh, approach was, it can be typified by the writings of Jeremy Bentham. Now there's a lot of danger with this approach, at least I think there is, uh, because if anyone supposes that another way, say communism, can produce more wealth, then freedom and liberty can just be tossed overboard. So I'm not a, not a big fan of that, but um, I do think that, that freedom leads to higher le levels of prosperity. Uh, look at North and South Korea. Look at Hong Kong versus mainland China before they open themselves up to trade. Uh, East and West Germany. I mean, example after example after example, we see that freedom works. Um, the next approach is the objectivist approach. And uh, this is characterized by the writings of Ayn Rand. Now, what she does, she begins with the, the individual, methodological individualism, because only individuals have minds. Again, no collective nouns. Now, since each individual is solely united with his own mind, there's no separation or divorcing of one's own mind with his person. Each person thus has full ownership over themselves. The implication is that all individuals are on the same plane, or on the same level as, or are on par with each other in their self-ownership. So, you own yourself, I own me, we all own ourselves. So, as such, no one person, for any reason, can make any claim over any other for any reason. The concept of rights flows from this idea of self-ownership and closely follows the natural rights approach. And it does so without reference to God. She, she, she was an atheist. Um, and then the, the last approach that I would just, just put up here is the societal approach. And uh, we see this in the writings of uh, William Graham Sumner. Uh, what social classes owe to each other and uh, the forgotten man as two principal works they wrote. Uh, sorry, no props for this. I have, I have no, no book. You can just imagine. Now, what, uh, what Sumner said in his, um, in his book, What Social Classes Owe to Each Other, uh, blends a bit of the utilitarian with the empirical, um, with the notion of prior rights to show that there are rules for society that work and other rules that just don't. Uh, he was a pioneer in the field of sociology and he argues that a society based on contract is the strongest form of society. Um, here's an example of what Sumner has to say. Sumner says, in our modern state and in the United States more than anywhere else, the social structure is based upon contract and the status is of and status, like who is your parents, are you uh, royalty, or anything like that, is of least importance. It is also, uh, contract, however, is, is rational, even rationalistic. It is also realistic, cold, and matter-of-fact. A contract relation is based on a sufficient reason, not on custom or prescription. A society based on contract is a society of free and independent men, who form ties without favor or obligation and cooperate without cringing or intrigue. I mean, people will gladly become garbage men or work on a cleaning staff if you pay them enough. Right? Sumner continues. It says, A society based on contract, therefore, gives the utmost room and chance for individual development and for all the self-reliance and dignity of a free man. That a society of free men cooperating under contract is by far the strongest society which has ever yet existed. That no such society has ever yet developed the full measure of strength of, of which it is capable and that the only social improvements which are now conceivable lie in the direction of more complete realization of a society of free men united by contract are points which cannot be controverted. And so Sumner is saying, look, you're born in this position, you're king, you're lord of the manor, you're born in that position, and so therefore you must serve. That's a weak relationship, because people aren't happy having to serve. The rulers take it for granted, they don't 
have the society or the realm's best interest at heart. But if you compare and contrast that with a contractual relationship, where you have to offer someone enough to make it worth their while to become a member of the cleaning staff or a garbage man or mine coal out of the ground, they will do this quite happily. And you see the difference in those types of societies. Some rules are just better than others for, for societies. So what's the analysis so far? Well, the analysis so far is this. Uh, we're all individuals, and as such, we have worth. This value cannot be sacrificed by others, non-owners, for their ends. The first right is life. But when we say that, we mean the right not to be hit, murdered, or raped, or anything like that. It is not a right to a standard of living. Or even the right to violate others' rights to maintain your own life. In other words, you cannot steal bread, even if you're hungry and will die without that bread. Okay, you can't just steal someone else's bread. Now the corollary to this is that with freedom comes responsibility. If no one else is responsible for you, you have to take care of yourself. And that's a pretty scary thing. You have to be responsible for yourself? I know. Now, coming from that right, and you can see where this leads then, since we're talking about responsibility, is that of liberty. Now, each of us has, has faculties and talents that we can use to uh, preserve and develop and perfect our lives. It is the freedom to think as we think, to perceive the world as we perceive it, and to express ourselves as we wish. These are what constitute the right of liberty. Now, a hermit, he doesn't care about the right to liberty. Now, why is that? Well, because there's no one there to impose any limitation on him. You see, it's because we live in society that we need to make distinctions between who can do what with which items. This leads us to the development of the third right, property. Now, property rights are the core of freedom, of a free society. They protect and allow for cooperation. Their source stems from individual action. And Harper... This guy. Oh, actually, here's a picture of him. They called him Baldy. He has a little bit of hair. I think that's kind of unfair. But, uh, but in this book here, he says this. The only method consistent with liberty is one that distinguishes between mine and thine according to the rule that the producer shall have the right to the product of his own labor. This foundation of economic liberty is important above all other considerations. By this concept, the right of ownership arises simultaneously with the production of anything. And ownership resides there until the producer owner chooses to consume the product or transfer its ownership to another person through exchange, gift, or inheritance. The right to produce a thing thereby becomes the right to own it. So if you have the right to make it, then you have the right to own it. Those are inseparable. And to deny one right is in effect to deny both. This concept specifies that no part of production shall properly belong to a thief, or to a slave master, or to a ruler by whatever title. If I make it, it's mine. I don't care what the majority of people have voted for mine, I made it. Murray Rothbard in his book The Ethics of Liberty essentially says the same thing. Now these rights are intertwined with each other and the loss of one life, liberty, property means that we lose all of them. Back to Bastia. Look, if I have the greats, I'm going to use the greats. I like these guys. So Bastia says this, he says, Each of us has a natural right from God to defend his person, his liberty, and his property. 
These are the three basic requirements of life, and the preservation of any one of them is completely dependent upon the preservation of the other two. For what are our faculties but the extension of our individuality? And what is property but an extension of our faculties? What is it that makes us us? If we are able to constantly protect each of these rights constantly and continuously, then we can group together to protect these rights. And so Bastia again, he says, if every person has the right to defend, even by force, his person, his liberty, and his property, then it follows that a group of men have the right to organize and support a common force to protect these rights constantly. Thus the principle of collective right, its reason for existing, its lawfulness, is based upon the individual right. And the common force that protects this collective right cannot logically have any other purpose or any other mission than that for which it acts as a substitute. Thus, since an individual cannot lawfully use force against the person, liberty, or property of another individual, then the common force, for the same reason, cannot lawfully be used to destroy the person, liberty, or property of individuals or groups. If I can't steal from someone, then the collective also does not have that right. Now, why is that? Well, because rights precede government. Rights precede statutes. They come before. Our individual rights do not come from government. They're not granted to us by a constitution or a declaration of rights. I mean, re recall the Declaration of Independence. It says this, and you have a copy of this in your... Uh, in your books. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, pay special attention to this next part that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and then to institute a new government. So the rights come first. And when government separates us, or violates our rights, separates us from our property, or violates our rights, then the government is behaving unlawfully. You say, but what if they've passed a law? Then it's legal, right? Yeah, it's legal. But it's still plunder. We'll get to that in a moment. Back to the Declaration of Independence. Um, later on it says, um, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations are pursuing invariably the same object, events as a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. The Declaration of Independence is absolutely radical. This perspective overturns thousands of years of human thinking. Many revolutions have since used this language to justify their fight for freedom. So what then is freedom? Okay, so we're, we're so many minutes into our talk. What, what's freedom? We haven't even defined it yet. Well, Mises points out, says that uh, freedom always means freedom from arbitrary action on the part of the police power. Freedom from arbitrary action on the part of police power. Liberty is not the freedom to do anything like rob and kill riot and loot. Start swinging your arms until you punch someone in the nose. It can only exist when it is circumscribed by the rights described above. 
Now many wish to extend these rights and convert them into the freedom froms that I talked about at the beginning. Freedom from want, freedom from hunger, freedom from illness. Now the concept of, of legal plunder is very useful for refuting these false freedoms. And since no individual can violate rights, and since the government derived from uh, the government is derived from individuals' rights, then it cannot have any extra powers. It doesn't have any extra rights or superior rights. Right? So I've got these rights of life, liberty, property. That means what? That means I can't take a gun, come up to Jay. How do I know he's Jay? Got a name tag, that's why you have to wear name tags. And I say, give me all your money. Why? That's stealing. Now, if I take all your money, and I go out and I buy a pad of paper and a charcoal pencil, and I give it to Jonathan over here, it's still stealing. Even if you call it the National Endowment for the Arts, it's still stealing. I can't do that. And so the government, which is the collection of us, also does not have that power. Where would it get that power from if it derives all of its powers from us? If I should not steal, then neither should the government. When government passes a law making its actions legal, oh, we passed a law, it's legal, we can do it. It's still violating rights, it's still plundering. And so Bastiat uses the phrase legal plunder. He says this, but how is legal plunder to be identified? He says, quite simply, see if the law takes from some persons what belongs to them and gives to other persons to whom it does not belong. See if the law benefits one citizen at the expense of another by doing what the citizen himself cannot do without committing a crime. This is why I use the grades, because it's just so clear. Did you take it from him? Yeah. It's stealing. But we voted on it. It's still stealing. Bostow says, now legal plunder can be committed in an infinite number of ways. Thus we have an infinite number of plans for organizing it, such as, I like this list, tariffs, protection, benefits, subsidies, encouragements, progressive taxation, public schools, guaranteed jobs, guaranteed profits, minimum wages, a right to relief, a right to the tools of labor, free credit, and so on and so on. Bailouts. Oh. All these plans as a whole, with their common aim of legal plunder, constitute socialism. Now, let's take a step back. I, I can take a step. You sit there. <laughs> Law is force. Government is force. It is coercion. At its root, that's what it is. It is to threaten to violently reduce people's options. You don't want to do that? Well, you're going to jail. We are violently reducing your options when you're in jail. If you don't believe me, try not paying taxes. Now, before government can do anything, it must first take. And so the goal of the law should not be to promote justice or to cause justice to reign. It ought to be stated that the purpose of the law is to prevent injustice from reigning. Notice there's a slight distinction. Instead of trying to reach an impossible ideal of perfect justice, what we should be trying to do is to reduce the amount of injustice. And both the right and the left agree on this. They say, yeah, we want to reduce injustices. Now, however... We cannot violate rights to promote justice. So in order for government to stop the injustice of starving people, right, people are starving, that's an injustice, we want to prevent this, government would first have to take from others, which in itself is a violation of rights and an injustice. So we can't move any closer to justice by creating these new injustices. You see what's going on here? It's like I'm curing one injustice by creating another injustice. So, 
All we can do then is remove the injustices whenever we find them, such as governments, wealth redistribution plans, and so forth. It is by the negation of these injustices that we move closer to justice. So if I am negating these takings, these stealings, then we move closer to justice. But we cannot actively pursue justice. Right? We have to sort of think of it as a negative concept. Now, unfortunately, the way in which society perceives itself has changed. Changed over the last hundred years. Specifically, the argument has historically stemmed from the perspective that we are fallen beings. We need limits because of our flawed nature. Original sin. But how does this all change? How does the idea of liberty change when we view ourselves as risen apes? We are no longer flawed, but we have conquered. We are better than every other species. We have the power to pull ourselves out of the primordial ooze. And so why shouldn't we also have the power to plan a society? Such hubris is what Friedrich Hayek called the fatal conceit. This idea that we have all this smart, all this knowledge that we can use to plan society. And we'll be talking later on this week about um, what knowledge is actually out there that might be inarticulate knowledge or tacit knowledge that can't be communicated uh, or observed directly. Right? Can't be collected by a central planning board. So what we see then is that if people believe that we can shape society as uh, an artist can shape clay, or as Adam Smith said, we move pieces on a chessboard. So do we have, we, we think that we can then shape and change society to the better because we studied this, we're sociologists and we know now. Hmm. But when we do this, now we start looking at the basic things. And we see that people ask, they don't even ask the question anymore. Do we have a right to education? Do we have a right to education? Now, Sheldon Richmond later this week is going to talk about an education system that is not run by the government. Do we have a right to water? I mean, or Mountain Dew. Mmm, yummy and delicious. I will use this as a prop in the next lecture. Um, because without water, how can I have life? Without education, how can I have liberty or property? What about a right to health care? I mean, think about this. A right to health care. Hmm. So, if I was standing on a street corner, and there was a, an MD, medical doctor, standing next to me, and we were chatting, la, 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 la. Well, actually, that would be singing, but <laughs> chatting, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I was so, so engrossed with this that I was not paying any attention. I step into the street and, bam, get hit by a car. There I am, lying in the street, bleeding, dying, not at all happy. <laughs> Do I have a right... To health care. Now, what does it mean to have a right to health care? That means that I can turn to my friend and go, give me health care. Probably gurgling with blood and, you know. But give me health care. Now, a right to health care means that he must use his property, his talents, his time to help me out. Now, think about this relationship that we have. Who's commanding who? Are we equals? No. If I have a right to his time, his skills, his property, his labor, that makes me master, superior. It puts me on a higher plane. It makes him subordinate. 
You say, but, but you're dying. You, you need help. Otherwise, otherwise you will die. That's true. Absolutely true. But um, should he help? That's a different question. Should he help? Does he have a moral obligation? That's a different question of whether or not I have a right. Because what happens when I claim a right to his labor? I'm enslaving him for my purposes to that degree. Now if he has a moral obligation, where does that come from? What is that? That's compassion. Where does compassion come from? It comes from the human heart. Remember, if I'm forcing him, if I have a right, that means the government will force him to help me. That's all government is, is coercion. Here's a gun. Help him. Or help me. If someone's pointing a gun to your head, are you being charitable? Does the doctor have, have is he being compassionate? Is he being charitable? If uh, someone points a gun to him and says, fix this person up. No. Does he even have the, the opportunity to be compassionate and, and charitable? His ability to decide to be charitable has been taken away from him. Because a decision has been forced upon him. Now he is no longer acting morally. If I see someone who wants food or clothing or, or something, and I give them some money, it comes from my heart. I'm being compassionate. I'm being charitable. But you're not being compassionate or charitable when you're, you're paying taxes. Right? When you go up to the pearly gates and you see St. Peter, and St. Peter says, have you, have you served your fellow man? Have you been compassionate and acted charitably to your fellow man? And you say, look at my, my, my 1040 form. <laughs> he, he's not going to take that, is he? He's like, no, you, you didn't get a signature on that. No. <laughs> so, so the law cannot force compassion. And the law is not being charitable. Government is not being charitable. But we have to bail out General Motors. Why? Because all these people will lose their jobs. Well, that's sad. That's sad. But don't chalk it up as charity that we're trying to keep these people in jobs. Absolutely not. It's anything but. I and the rest of you have been forcibly made co-owners. Whatever that means. So back to Bastia. One last time. He says, It is not true that the function of law is to regulate our consciences, our ideas, our wills, our education, our opinions, our work, our trade, our talents, or our pleasures. The function of law is to protect the free exercise of these rights, life, liberty, property, and to prevent any person from interfering with the free exercise of these same rights by any other person. Since law necessarily requires the support of force, its lawful domain is only in the areas where the use of force is necessary. This is justice. Every individual has the right to use force for lawful self-defense. It is for this reason that the collective force, which is the only organized combination, or which is only the organized combination of the individual forces, may lawfully be used for the same purpose. Right? It's only self-defense. And it cannot be used legitimately for any other purpose. Now, you can use it for other things. I mean, clearly, look at the society we live in. How, when you define inside as standing under an, you know, a little awning or something. So, is all that government does really just some type of plunder? Should we even have a government? Right, when we um, go down that road 
and um, I have several friends who are down that road, they call themselves anarcho-capitalists, right? Anarchy, but not like the, the bad anarchy. This is capitalist anarchy. Okay. Now, Harper, one last time, this guy, it's a good book. I'm, I'm really pleased with this book. Um, addresses anarcho-capitalist or anarcho-capitalism, yeah, anarcho-capitalism question in this way. He says, based on all that has been said, one might easily conclude that government is entirely negative force so far as liberty is concerned. He might conclude that anarchy would be the ideal society, that liberty would be complete under anarchy. That would be true if all persons were perfect, but they are not. And this comes back to the question of how do we perceive ourselves? Are we fallen beings or are we risen apes? With human frailties as they are, anarchy affords the opportunity for certain powerful and tyrannical individuals to enslave their fellow men to the extent of their power to gain and keep control over others. So some degree of governmental function is necessary if liberty is to be at a maximum. Violators of liberty must be restrained so that the rights of liberty will be protected for those who respect them and play the game of society according to the rules of liberalism. The good liberalism, classical liberalism. Thus, at one extreme, the absence of government allows anarchy to rob the people of their liberty, whereas at the other extreme, the government itself becomes the robber of liberty. The task in a liberal society therefore, is to find that point where all people will enjoy the greatest possible degree of liberty. Now, personally, I'm really close to anarcho-capitalism. I buy a lot of their arguments. I see a whole bunch of it. I think that we should all strive to reduce plunder and expand liberty as much as we can. And then, when we get to that little minarchist state, when I get that last little tiny state, then maybe then I, I, I might decide, yeah, maybe we should abolish that last little bit of government or so. But, but that's not really a debate that we need. Because what, we're so far from that point right now. It's sort of, you know, how many angels are dancing on the, on the top of a Mountain Dew bottle? I mean, it's kind of pointless. You know, we, what we need to do is all pull, the, pull in one direction and pull hard. Not fight with each other. Um, now, my thoughts on what the right size of government is right now is um, imagine your own personal worst enemy. Right? And you know who that is. Right? Your own personal worst enemy. And they can be placed in charge of the, of the government and you would be okay with it. Because like right now, if, I, if my own personal worst enemy was placed in... in position of power and they control the courts and the um, IRS and other taxing authorities, regulatory, in the, the, my life would be miserable. But if we could reduce government to the size where you could take your own personal worst enemy, put them in charge of all the things that government does and you're okay with it, that's a pretty good sized government. Now, I've, uh, I've asked many questions. I've raised many questions that uh, each of us is attempting to answer. Because um, there are some answers. Communism bad. But uh, the task set before us is, is to find the, that greatest possible degree of liberty for society. And, and this week is, is Freedom University. And what we should do is explore what exactly that means through good discussion and deep thinking. So I'm really excited about this week. I'm going to be here through Friday. Uh, actually, I leave Friday morning, so don't look for me on Friday. Um, and you can ask me stuff, and I will attempt to evade and dodge every question you throw at me uh, as best I can, but I might get tricked into an answer. But uh, these are age-old questions that many people have been asking and these are the sorts of questions that you will be asking. And so I'm looking forward to this week, and I will actually take some of your questions now. If you have any. Perhaps you don't. Jonathan. Um. Oh, and, and also I have to repeat your question for the benefits of the recording. So I might mangle your, your question. Um, if you do agree with 
agree with the perspective if you have the right to make it, you have the right to own it. What would you say to the theoretical situation in which I would have the ability to make nuclear weapons? Would I then have the right to own them as well? Are you going to make any? <laughs> really? I said it was theoretical. <sighs> Seriously? This is what we want to discuss at Freedom University? Can I make a nuclear weapon? Well, you understand, like, I'm not, obviously not asking the questions because I'm planning to make nuclear weapons. <laughs> well, this is good! Attempting, this is very good! Attempting to understand aspects of the book. Look, if, if, what, okay, if, if, if we're in this state where, where people are not allowed to violate other people's rights, why would you spend all that money making a nuclear weapon? If you're not allowed to nuke anyone, and, and I mean, that's different than, say, nuclear power or some sort of fusion drive that will, will move you somewhere. But, but I mean, I'm, so I'm going to build a weapon to violate other people's rights? That, um, you don't, you wouldn't make things that are dangerous based on the fact that you're not allowed to violate anyone. No, I'm just, I'm just, you know, that's a very expensive weapon to protect yourself from encroachments. Okay, so let's say guns. No. Well, if you look at the Second Amendment, what's the Second Amendment about? It's the right to bear arms. And it's, it's not like, oh, look at that arm. Look at how, how perfectly well tanned that arm is. No. It, it's, it's, about having, it's about having the capacity to overthrow governments that violate your rights. And, uh, and should you have, have the right to, to build such safeguards? Yes. But uh, specifically nuclear weapons, if you want to build a nuclear weapon, as long as you don't use it, I'm okay with it. <laughs> But, I mean, it, it's sort of out there. So, but then you would be saying that if I did build them and you didn't care as long as I didn't use them, how, do you think that the government should not be responsible for ensuring that I don't use them? That would be really nice that uh, you wouldn't use them. Um, now, how, how, do we, how do we ensure that? Remember, remember this little part where I said, you know, we have to find that, that happy medium between the two? Um, well, be between, between allowing people to wave their arms like crazy people until it comes just right up to their nose. Um, look, we, li we live in a society. And uh, we've, we've always lived in a society. We don't live as, as individual automatons out on some secluded island. So a hermit could have nuclear weapons, sure. But um, we live in a society where, and this is what Sumner talks about, where we see that, that laissez-faire... Is, is the means of achieving the greatest sort of society. Um, and, that's, and that's really what we want in the end. And, and yeah, we have to curtail some rights um, so that we don't have, you know, people nuking other people in Wisconsin or something. I don't know. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I think they're fairly closely aligned because, um, you know, because because they're both stem, they're both coming out of out of the individualist philosophy. Um, they're look. This is this is an hour chit chat, right? So so trying to summarize all this, uh, and and you, you're probably well aware that there's extensive literature on on natural rights theories and and objectivism and such. Um, but I, th but I think the, uh, the, the common root that we see in each and all of these is that there is this idea that the individual has worth, that there are rights inherent in the individual that, that come before government, and that that's why government is constituted, and that this sort of arrangement works better than any other society, even though if we can't articulate the laws and why this might work, and that's part of, part of Hayek's thinking, um, but this is this this approach of freedom is what leads people to have the happiest sorts of lives. Because how many lives do we live? Just just one. And in all of the universe, of all of time and space, how many of you will there ever be? This is it. Now, how sad it would be that if that you have to live your life according to someone else's whims or caprices. 
That's a, that's a horrible tragedy. And so it's, it's the, the breaking of those bonds, which is what's so radical um, and, and horrifies people because at the same time it makes them responsible for themselves. And no one else will take care of them except for themselves. Um, you know, within, you know, you can have familiar reasons, you know, families and such. All right, I'm babbling. That's it. I, th I think they, they tend to pull in the same direction. I think they're, they're fairly similar. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think we all have uh, different religious persuasions, and my question is based on religion and liberty. What I want to ask, a lot of people view uh, religion as a political force and a threat to liberty. What, what, what do you think about that? How does, how does religion impact? I'm, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Uh, what I'm saying is this, um, some, most people view religion, right, as a political force and a threat to liberty. Because we, basically we all have different, uh, we all have different religious persuasions. Of, I mean, I come from Africa and mm -hmm. most people are very religious. And okay. So religion, religions create some form of institutions. And for example, when I was a kid, my father took me to, I mean, my, my parents would take me to uh, a particular church. Right. 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 And, uh, I'll say um, I, that church puts limitation, limitations with regards to I mean what I can do. Yes. Right. Okay. And for example, I mean some religious persuasion uh, make people I mean. Uh, okay. So some religions uh, curtail freedom, and that causes right. conflicts and the different things. Okay. Uh, so so how does how should we? How does liberty deal with this? Well, uh, let's, let's broaden it out so, so that it's not just religion, but um, um, and William Graham Sumner says that, that uh, laissez-faire and liberty is a policy maxim. And, and what do we mean by that? It says, if we live in, in a society of laissez-faire, then if a group of people want to get together and start their own commune, start their own little socialist or communist experiment in uh, Missouri. They're perfectly free and welcome to do that. But if we live in a world of communism and a group of people wanted to get together and say, hey, we'd like to get together and have a little niche of laissez-faire, we'd get stomped out. Now, if we compare those two, Right? What laissez-faire does is it allows the different competing philosophies, the different competing religions to coexist peacefully, right? Because they're not allowed to in, in, uh, invade other groups' rights, right? So if religion A is a successful religion, and by successful I mean it is, it's attracting people to it, people like it, and so it grows, right? There's no conflict then that, that emerges. Uh, until they they pick up you know guns or machetes or, or whatever and start start hurting other people, okay. But if 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 we have basically a, a, a laissez-faire policy that that just limits people to to natural rights, life, liberty, property, and this is if you want to live like like a pilgrim, and you have all these austere laws and rules for your for your followers, that's fine with us. Or if you want no religion at all. That's fine with us. Or if you want to live in, in a commune, that's fine with us. And we see that in the United States there have been communes that popped up and communist experiments here and there, and they fade. They die out after a generation because people get, get uh, sick and tired of it. And the kids then leave. And the ideals fade away. And so under a system of laissez-faire, we can see which system is better. And maybe, and according to Sumner, says, well, maybe there is some other form of, of organizing humanity that is better, but that would only emerge under a, a society of laissez faire. So let's try freedom first. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Uh, if people will theoretically have to violate the natural rights of other people to protect their own natural rights, when do our natural rights stop becoming rights and start becoming privileges? Give me an example. Did you have something in mind? Okay, like if somebody has to take something from another person to ensure that their own life can continue to succeed and protect their own natural life, right to life, how does that stop becoming a natural right to life and start becoming the privilege of life? Okay, so if somebody wants to take something in order to continue to be alive, um, 
then, then where, where do we draw that? Well, I would draw the line at the, the first part, taking. Right? If, uh, if you have bread and I need bread to live, um, I can't steal it from you. That's, that's where I would draw the line. I'm dying there in the street bleeding and the doctor's standing there looking over me. I have no right to his labor, to his, to his skills. Now, he might have a moral compunction and you might also be moved because I'm pretty pathetic and tearful. But, uh, but for me to claim a right means that I can have the full weight and force of government point a gun at you and take from you. And as soon as that happens, your rights have been violated and then it's just, it's just a slippery slope. So then theoretically, like, is it welfare in the United States a pr giving the privilege of life to people who otherwise necessarily would be deprived of it? It's legal plunder. Welfare in the United States is legal plunder. It is a violation of natural rights. Um, I don't think that, that being alive is a privilege. So, not sure I'm completely there. Go ahead. Um, and when you say you have a right to life, does that mean you have a right to fight for your life, basically? Protect your life. Protect the, your the right life. to life is to protect your life. Keep yourself alive and not hurt others in the process unless they're going to hurt you. Because you can't, you can't steal from someone to keep yourself alive. It, it, is, it is the right to self-defense, but you can't become the aggressor. Yes. yes. Okay. Then, then I would agree with that. Um, Jay. How do you respond to the, the thought that, you know, if, if property is taken by force, that kind of makes it invalid to exchange later. But at one point, all property is taken by force. Like, is that a question? Start, like, why does it, well, why does it start in, you know... 1762 or whatever, now is where property rights are valid. Yeah, all, all, the time they you know? yeah, all, all property is theft, so theft is property, so it's mine now. Um, well, well, look, uh, I think it was uh, Compte who said that uh, all property is theft. Um, look, there, there's this thing called history and sunk costs, and um, it kind of is the way it is right now. Now, Having said that, suppose that um, I steal your watch from you, and I notice that you're not wearing a watch because I've stolen it. No, actually, it's a Walmart watch. Um, but suppose I steal that watch from you, right? And uh, I pass it on to my son, and he passes it on to his son. And so your grandson meets my grandson and says, hey, that's my grandfather's watch. Does he have a right to it back? And I would say yes, absolutely, because it was initially stolen. So what are the implications about this? The implications are, do you have the right to reparations? Yes, within limits. If you can identify who stole what and in what degree. Right? So if your grandson can determine that this was his watch, uh, or my, your watch, then he, yes, he has the right to it back. Um, but there is history. And because you have multiple people claiming the exact same thing, if you can't draw a straight line to it, then, then it becomes a, a mess. Right? But, but in, in this, this philosophy, that principle is there. The principle of, of justice is, is there. Um, but it just becomes more difficult the further back you go. And at some point you have to say, look, we can't identify whose that was. You know, it was yours and yours and yours and yours. And, and at this point, you can't identify that. He gets it. Whoever, did, has it. whoever has it now. You know, right? Because you can't you can't create an injustice to create to try to create a justice. Go ahead. No individual can destroy rights. Well, I think so. Yes. <laughs> this, this society then, the individual gives, gives society 
society the right to take away rights? Do individuals give society the right to take away rights? Right. Uh, okay. Now, when we use society, we're using a collective noun, so we have to be kind of careful how we're, how we're using it. Um, individuals have the right to the constant protection of their natural rights. And since I have the right to constant protect, constantly protect my rights, I can align myself with a group of friends. And we can create a group that will have a night watchman, you know, watch out for all of our rights constantly. Now, does that mean that we're subtracting away from other people's rights? Well, no, because we don't live in a, in a world of unlimited freedom. Right? If you were a hermit, you would. If you were in isolation, you would have unlimited freedom. But because we live in society, we have to draw lines and, and bright lines around other people's rights, particularly property rights. Because what property rights then do is it, it not just separates mine versus thine, but it gives me the ability to be... Uh-oh, they're coming. <laughs> for, for those of you on, on, on the... Yeah, on the video there was a siren over there. Um, but what, what property rights, what, what they do is they are able to protect us from, from capriciousness and arbitrary use of force and, and, and that's what allows us to work together and coexist together. So they're not really subtracting anything, they're not really destroying any rights. Because you still have the right to liberty, you just don't have the right to punch me in the nose. You, you never had that right. And so you're, you're, you don't have a right to swing your, your fist into my nose. Okay, go ahead. In your doctor, I want your response to the argument that um, the doctor's obligation to your right to have a patient care is not the So, so because society has contributed, he's, he's saying, he's saying um, how, if we say that society has helped create the, the medical establishment uh, and the medical field, then society has a right to the fruits of the products of, of the medical field. Is that fairly close? Sure. Okay. <laughs> he says sure, so I'm going to run with it. I think it literally was fairly close. Okay. Oh, thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan okay, so I guess that's right. Um, well, I, I, th I think what you're, what, what you're doing is you're falling into that collective noun trap. Because there, there is no such thing as, as society. Right? Society didn't, didn't go to school. Right? It was the doctor. The society didn't stay up till four in the morning trying to uh, memorize the different types of uh, bones in the hand or anything like that. Right? That was the individual. Uh, society didn't build the building that the hospital is. Right? They didn't put society and put the bricks there. It was individuals. And so when we, we start using these ideals such as society has done, we're saying the same thing as General Motors has filed uh, for bankruptcy, right? We, we, can't, we can't look at it like that. But Well, if we say that society is a compilation of individuals, then what are the contractual arrangements? I will donate $5,000 to help the blah, blah, blah fund or memorial wing, $5 million, to the blah, blah, blah wing of the such and such hospital if I can get their services whenever I want them to. So um, that's a contractual relationship and perfectly legitimate. Um, but that's not society doing that. Okay? And if I have um, a gun and I say, give me all your tax money, and then other people then vote and spend it in some other way, that again is not society. Right? So, so it's, it's, it's this collective noun that, that's the troublesome point. And these are the sorts of questions that you're going to be asking and trying to answer yourselves and not just throughout the rest of this week, but this is a nice crucible for this sort of stuff, but, uh, but for the rest of your lives.
these are the sorts of questions that, that don't go away. And, they're, and you're going to change your mind a few times. And that's okay. That's part of growing. But uh, I think Ben is saying, uh, soup's on, right? We have a right to dinner. We have a right to dinner. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Enjoy dinner, and uh, I'll see you after.